Thank you for listening to this recording of Family Bible Church's Sunday morning message. We pray that God will use this word to bless and encourage you. Amen. Second Corinthians is where we, we are studying Paul's second epistle to the church of Corinth. And um, last week as we began this study, we saw that Paul in this writing is, is taking on the concept of afflictions. Um, not a pleasant subject to us, one that we'd rather not talk about. And um, it's a longer letter, it's a longer book. But through it, um, as Paul begins his writing last week, as we began looking at it, we looked at his thesis statement, if you would, in his letter in those first seven verses, that um, the purpose of afflictions in our life ultimately is for us to be able to experience the encouragement of God being brought to us, that as we are afflicted, that if you have that relationship with him, then you can receive the encouragement of God, not just so you can become fat with his, that, that encouragement, but that rather you can then turn around and be a dispenser, if you would. You can dispense that encouragement to others who are going through afflictions as well. You can do that evangelistically for those who are unbelievers, who don't know God, and they wonder, how can you handle this? I mean, how do you go through this? And you can be able to tell them about the love of Christ and the faithfulness of your God who helps you to go through these afflictions. You can do it then edificationally to those who are in the body, whether in this assembly or others' assembly, but those who are believers, that you can go and you can remind them, you can encourage them how God has seen you through, and God will see them through as well, and they can receive the encouragement of God through you. In that um, message as well, I mentioned that Paul spends a lot of time through this course of this epistle where he's going to talk about his own afflictions, the afflictions that he's had, um, and then also using some illustrations from the church um, of Corinth, what they've gone through. And today in this message, we actually begin to, to, to see that, that Paul was going to begin to address his own sorrows and afflictions, but then draw into those of the Corinthian church as well. And so as Chuck also, kind of a side here, but as Chuck also mentioned that he's constantly amazed about uh, Paul being the king of run-on sentences, uh, Paul it gives me encouragement as well. Paul many times does rabbit trails, but Paul's much better than I am at coming back from his rabbit trail. Maybe that's something by maybe writing it down. Where was I at on, when I started talking about that, Silas? You were talking about this, Paul. Oh, yeah, okay, let's come back to that. Um, but, and that's, we're going to see that here. So um, on mine, so as I, you know, again, you know that as I go through this and I work through it, I actually have my own copy of, of the passage, right? And so color-coded and everything else with different things. But on mine, then it starts here in 1 Corinthians 1, right? But then right here, I've got a little insertion that says, begin a parenthesis. And then it comes all the way down toward the end of chapter 2, and I have the end of the parenthesis. You may title that if you want, beginning of the rabbit trail, and the end of the rabbit trail. But Paul, again, is very good at coming back to his original statement, okay? And that was um, the burdens, his burdens, okay? And um, and those things. And so as we go through this passage, if you have the sermon note sheet, you'll kind of note, it's kind of like, you know, whoa, we go from chapter 1 all the way to the end of chapter 2, and then we're going to come back into chapter 1 and chapter 2 again, and that's kind of what we're going to do, because we're going to deal with the, the, the outer parts of the parenthesis, and then we'll come back and we'll talk about the parenthesis um, as we go through that. And so Paul is, first of all, talks about his burden. And what's interesting to me, and again, what I love about the Word of God is that God doesn't hide things. It would make, it would really, you know, if you want to sell people on a religion, you don't put into it about, and if you come to Jesus, you're going to suffer. Do you want to sign up for that? I mean, listen, I want you to know my God. Because when you come to know my God, you'll get to know the fellowship of his sufferings. Jesus died on the cross, man. You know, people, they whipped them, they beat them, they, they bludgeoned them, they spit on them. Don't you want to suffer? I mean, don't you want to suffer like Jesus? Don't you want to fellowship with those sufferings? I mean, not too many people run in the door because they want that. But that's exactly following Jesus. And Paul wants us to know that. That Jesus said, just as they persecuted me, so they will 
persecute you. If they've done it to the master, to the teacher, so they will do it to the followers or the students. And so it shouldn't take us by surprise when there are struggles in life. God in the the flesh, when he lived on the earth, bore up with afflictions. I'm mindful of Yenta and the um, fiddler on the roof. She's, you know, one of her famous lines is, if God came to the earth, they would throw stones at his windows. He did. They did. If you think about that. God came to the earth. He walked amongst them. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. And worse than they didn't just receive him, they didn't just reject him, but then they fought against him brought afflictions to his path. And so, yet Jesus was, as the book of Hebrews tells us, was tempted, tried, troubled in every way such as we are, yet without sin. That is what makes God different than mortal man. We're troubled, and we what? We sin. We trouble with, with with the sin of it all. So, Paul, the extent of his afflictions. What does he say? Back up to verse 8. For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our flipsis. That's our word, affliction. So our trouble there is our word flipsis that we talked about a lot about last week. That's the word for affliction. Does anybody remember what flipsis literally means? It means to be what? Pressed. Pressed, remember? So it's like that, that concert in Cincinnati when, when the, they didn't have the doors at that time that opened outward, they opened inwards, and everybody had a mass evacuation. The problem is the doors were shut, and so the people who got there first were pressed, crushed to death. That's this word. Pressed, pushed, crushed. And so that's our word for affliction, here translated as trouble. Okay. So Paul says, we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our affliction, our being pressed, which came to us in Asia. Now, that's not the continent of Asia. That's the, the, the area, the, the, the region of Asia. Asia Minor, we call it today. That's the Turkey area okay, of Rome. That we were burdened. I'm going to come back to that word in a moment. Burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired even of life. The word bereo. The word um, for burden there literally means to be weighed down due to a lack of strength. So it is used in Mark 26 and Mark 14 about the disciples in the garden when Jesus comes back to them and they found them what? Sleeping because their eyes were bereoed. Their eyes were heavy. They They were without strength. They were so weak and so tired that they couldn't help themselves but fall asleep. Luke 9, 32, on the Mount of Transfiguration, Peter and the other disciples did what? Fell asleep. I mean, can you imagine? It's like falling asleep during the ending of the fireworks. You know, you go through this whole thing, boom, boom. That's so exciting. But when you get to the grand finale, I mean, that's like everything, right? Boom, 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 boom. They're in the mountain transfiguration. Jesus being transfigured in front of them, right in their very face, and they fall asleep because they were heavied without strength. They just couldn't deal with it. 2 Corinthians 5, um, we'll read about that in a few weeks. Um, it says that being in this tabernacle we do groan being burdened first timothy five sixteen. if any man um da, 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 who's a believer they have widows let them relieve them and let not the church be charged or burdened weighed down weakened wearied by them that it may relieve those who really are widows indeed that's when that word's being used the idea of that word then is that you're really weighed down and weakened. So what is Paul? This is, I mean, this is, again, think about who this is. This is the Apostle Paul, superhero, super Christian, the one who was, you know, da-da-da-da-da, that we kind of sort of lift up a little bit. But this is Paul. Do you remember in the book of Acts when Paul was being beaten 
and stuff like that after he had been to Berea. What did they, what did they do for Paul? Does anybody remember? They put him on a, a boat, and they shipped him off to Athens for some R&R because he was wearied. This isn't something that's not, not real. This is, this is real life stuff. Paul, the superhero Christian, he said, I was the spirit of life. I, mean, I just wanted to die. I didn't think I could bear up with this anymore. Verse 9. We had the sentence of death in ourselves. That we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who, what? Raises the dead. I was at the point where I had no other hope. I wanted to go. I wanted it to be done. Have you ever been there? Where you just said, I'm done. I'm just done. Lord, I can't take anything more. This would be a good time. Massive heart attack. I don't feel anything. Bolt to the head. Whatever. Just let it go like this. I, I just can't handle it anymore. Some have gone through physical afflictions that I can't imagine to be able to endure. Paul is going to tell us later in this epistle, and I'm, so I don't want to kind of go up to those places. And, and, but he's going to give us a list of the things that he has endured, that he has gone through. And you think, wow, my life's pretty, pretty cakey compared to that, you know? But he comes down then to discuss this purpose. And it comes to three different places. <clears throat> First of all, toward those who trust him, toward those who were with him, with not trusting in him, but those who were with Paul, it's trust. The purpose was trust. So again, verse 9, Yes, we had a sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. And then he gives some description about how he does that. God who raises the dead, verse 10, who delivered us from so great a death and does deliver us in whom we trust that he will still deliver us. How cool is that? Past, present, and future. God what? Delivers. Isn't that kind of cool? God will deliver you. And when I am down in that wilderness that Gabrielle was singing about, when it feels like there is no other place that I can turn and I can go, there is. And the reality is it's because I haven't been thinking about it the whole long way, and that is I need to turn to God. Jesus was troubled. How? What's it, what's it say? He, in what? Say it again, Steve. Say it real loud. In every way. In every way. No, wait, wait. You've skipped that little, little part. In every way, such as we are. Ouch. He was troubled. He was tempted. He was tried. Periosmos. Again, remember the word periosmos I talk about a lot. Is, is, is a coin. It's a two-edged coin. It's a trial and a tribulation. James chapter 1 Kind of, uh, kind of all joy, brethren, when you fall into diverse kinds of trials. But then later it says, blessed is the man who endureth temptation. It's the exact same word in the Greek. It's the word periosmos. And so it's a troublesome situation. How you respond to the periosmos reveals what it was. If you fall, if you fail, it was a temptation. It revealed sin in you. If you stand to the troublesome situation, if you, if you work through it, it reveals faith in you. It was a trial. Does that make sense? It was just a troublesome situation. I'm riding down the road. I stopped at the stop sign. I began to go. The problem is that the guy coming the other way, what? Didn't stop. And he brought a periosmos, if you would, into my life. Does that make sense? No, that didn't really happen to me. I actually did that to somebody else. Okay? And so... And I, I, I always remember, I brought a periosmos into this life of these people. I don't even know them any. I mean, but 
it was there and they spun and they had to go for neck and whatever and I have no idea whether they're still dealing with their periosmos that Bob caused them. You know, so yesterday morning, what if I'm the what? I'm the affliction. It makes sense? There are times when clearly Bob has been the affliction um, in the lives of other people. And so, but for me, if that happened to me, then I have a, cha- I have a decision to make how I'm going to what? How I'm going to deal with it. How am I going to respond to this? That's what Paul's saying. Look, I mean, I was just down. I was ready to die. But God said, no, this is the time when you learn that my grace is sufficient. This is the time you realize that it's not about you, that it's all about me, that I am the giver of life. It's only when you fully come to die to self that you fully comprehend the life that Christ wants you to really have. Jesus said in John 17, verse 3, when he was beginning of his prayer for his disciples, he says, this is life eternal. Definition, eternal life, what is it? This is life eternal, that they may know you, the only true God, in Jesus Christ whom you've sent. Paul built upon that in his letter to the Philippians, Philippians chapter 3, and he said that his desire was that he might know Christ that he might know him in the power of his resurrection, but then also in the, the fellowship of his sufferings. It's a hard thing. It's not what I want to know. But the reality is it's that moment when I am down to nothing that the afflictions of this life have um, just wiped me out. That I get the opportunity to come to know God in a deeper and better way. Secondly, toward those who are praying for him. He goes on and says, um, verse 11, You also helping together in prayer for us, that thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the gift granted to us through many. So there are people who were what? They're praying for him. So, Tammy, as in your testimony earlier about the people who can't pick themselves up, their burden, this is exactly it. You know, there were times when people, you know, did, 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 did Paul have Facebook? Did he have Twitter? You know, did he honor, hey, I'm, 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 I'm down to death, pray for me right now. He didn't have it. But I'll guarantee there were times when people, that God burdened people to pray and they had no idea. I still remember back in 1994, it was in April of 94, and I won't get into all the details, but it was really bad um, in the church that I pastored at that time. In well, anyways, I was asked the night before, so hey, have you ever considered to go back into computer work or maybe into missions? I was like, don't beat around the bush. Let's talk about this. You know, Oh, we're going to talk about tomorrow night at the deacons meeting. Wow, wouldn't it be nice if someone talked to me ahead of time? Anyways, yada, yada, yada. So I go through this night of thinking that there were most people were against me. That's what I was led to believe. And I was just in full anguish. The next morning, I got a call from St. Louis um, from a guy, and I'll tell you his name, Ricky Dran. You don't know him, but he was the reason why we went to the church that we went to for Des- when we were Desert Storm duty in St. Louis. He taught the Sunday school class. He was an engineer with Anheuser-Busch, of all places. Okay? Anyways, phenomenal guy. I can tell you lots of stories about how God used him in an amazing way. Anyways, he calls me up Monday morning, that next Monday morning, and says, Bob, what is going on? He says, God has racked me all night for you. He says, what is happening? That's pretty cool. That's really cool. Ricky, you just don't know. He'd spent all night praying for me. Because God brought me onto his heart all night. There are some nights I wake up and I, I have somebody, not even in this church, it may be somebody secular, it may be some entertainment industry or whatever that I don't follow or whatever, but God, I got this name that's there, and it's like, Lord, I don't know why, you, but I know you want me to pray for them right now. I can tell you too many stories of people who have done that and found out later that it was a time um, um, that God wanted them to pray. There's one, one that's coming to my brain right now about this missionary who was, they, were, um, they had people coming in, aggressing against them, at that very night, and it was in the middle of the night over here in America, and it was a daytime over there where they were, and da-da-da-da, and the person didn't know, they just prayed for them. They had no idea what was going on, they just prayed for the people. They found out two years later, when they came back, these people came back to report, and they told of this instance, 
da 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 And so the guy came up, what, when was that? da 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 And so started, it was that very moment that God had woken him up in his dream, or in his dream, in his, in, in, from his sleep, that he wanted him to pray for those missionaries. Just an amazing thing. God had people praying for Paul without Paul even knowing it, if you would, because he knew that Paul needed the spiritual strength. That's why we pray for one another, because it's a spiritual war. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. There's a spiritual war that's going on. There's a, there's, we don't see it. It's kind of like the radio waves and the TV waves and all the other waves that are going on. Through the, have you ever thought about how many waves are going through your brain and, and your body right now? I mean, if you turned on the FM, we all had a radio station, you know, all, all had a little transistor radios on. I know some of you don't know what a transistor radio is. Anyways, and, and we all turned into a different frequency. Right now, we could have a cacophony of noise of music that's being played from waves that are just kind of going through here. Does that make sense? And then we could have cell phones going on and talking. And so you got all these different frequencies. Think about it. Every single one of us could be having a conversation on our cell phones all at the same time. Isn't that mind-boggling? And your voice and everybody else's voices are going through the air to some tower, and you don't see it. Do you get the spiritual realm? I mean, that's just a physical wave, and you don't see it. There is a spiritual war going on right now. What? The light is red. Okay? That, good, good catch. So, there is a spiritual war that is going on right now all around us. Demons, angels, whatever. It's an amazing thing. And so you wonder what's going on in your life. Look, if you know Jesus as your Savior, if you came to him, what did you do when you came to him? Think about it. Say again. What did you do? I know you humbled yourself. But at that moment, you who were dead to sin, you were a a follower of Satan, whether you realized it or not. What did you do? Come on. This, you what? You confessed, but what did you do? You became a traitor. You turned away from Satan, and you went into the camp of God. Satan loves you, right? He hates you. Do you get it? Now, he can't do anything to you that God hasn't what? Allowed. Job. Have you seen my servant Job? There's none like him. Righteous, honoring me, worshiping. That's because you don't let me at him. You let me at him. You bring, let me bring what? Affliction into his life. And we'll see how long he worships you. Paul said, the Lord gives. Or Paul, sorry, Job. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away, what? Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all these things, Job did not sin against God. Satan came back to to God. And God said what? Have you seen my servant Job? You let me do it. I let you bring those afflictions, but he still hasn't what? He still hasn't. That's skin for skin, God. That's because you won't let me touch him. Okay, you can touch him, but you can't kill him. And then the next phase happens, right? But still Job glorifies God in the midst of all that. There's a spiritual war. The Word of God tells us about this stuff. So that there are points where we can despair even of life. And so that whole thing about the the armor of God in Ephesians chapter 6 then comes back down where the the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, right? But in the very end, when you get all the, the, the spiritual armor together, the part that we normally don't talk about, what is the power of it all? Having done all this, pray. With all prayer and supplication for all the saints. That we pray for one another. That our fields of fire are... And I've talked about that a lot, about from the military background, from the side, you know, when you dig your foxhole, you, you put your parapet in front of you. I can't see in front of me. All I have is a little hole going off to the front right or off to the front left, depending on which side of my foxhole I'm in. My job is to protect everybody down on that side of the, of the line. 
I've got people looking at, so let's say I'm on the right side. This is for the tape, right, on the right side. So I've got all these people on the left side going down the line looking at the left side of their foxhole. They're watching my position. I'm trusting them that they're praying over me. Does it make sense? If we're not praying for one another, then what we're basically saying is it's really okay if the position gets overrun. We need to be praying for one another. Paul says that all these things happen so that when you see God deliver me, when you saw God deliver me, that you would be able then to offer up thanks. Isn't it overwhelming sometimes when you pray for somebody and you see God answer that prayer? And you think someone else must have been praying. I think that all the time. Well, I wonder who else was praying because I know he didn't answer me. Does it make sense? And yet, God delights in blowing our socks off by answering our prayer for one another. So, so the praying then for one another, but we move into the third one, which is in the chapter 2, that toward those who are observing him. Think about that. There is you and those who are with you who are undergoing these trials, right? Then you got those who are praying for you, but the reality is, in the world, you got people who are what? They're just watching. They're looking. And Paul says, down near, in beginning of verse 12 of chapter 2, he says, Furthermore, literally it's now, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, a door was opened to me by the Lord. I had no rest in my spirit because I did not find Titus my brother. But taking my leave of them, I departed from Macedonia. Now, thanks be to God who always leads us or causes to causes us to triumph in Christ. And through us diffuses, makes manifest, is literally the idea, so make it visible that people actually can see it, the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. The word fragrance, there's a couple words for fragrance, aromas in here that are two different words, but one of them is just an aroma and one of them is a sweet aroma, okay? The the idea is one of them is just an odor and the other is a nice odor. Does that make sense? But regardless, the point is that your life is an odor. It's an aroma, okay? As you walk around, your life, the word picture here, right, is like incense, and so the, the word picture that he's drawing is the Roman procession after there was a, a victory. They would come in and they would march in. The general would march in on his white horse and it was a great thing. But along in the procession were the victors, the soldiers, who were very sweaty and everything else from the battle. But there were also the... Say again? The slaves the conquered, who are being brought back for everybody to see, they also have an aroma and stink and all that from from the war. We are led like that, is the idea, by Christ as an aroma to God and to everybody else who's watching. To one, to those who are being saved, when they look at us, go through trials, and they they see what God does through us, it's a what? It's a a sweet aroma. This is exciting. But when the world looks at you, and you're standing for Christ, and they say, how can you do this? Because of the love of Christ that's in me. They go, what? Because they are dying. It's a stench of death to them. The the gospel of Jesus Christ is lovely. It's wonderful. It's condemning. When I say to you, you need to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, I want you to accept Christ as your Savior so you can be in His presence. You can go to heaven. You can be in the presence of God for all of eternity. You understand that what I'm really telling you is that I believe that right now you're what? You're going to hell. You're going to be separate from the presence of God. And that's what people hear. That you're judgmental. No, I'm not trying to be judgmental, but the reality is when you give the gospel, you are 
being judgmental. I mean, I'm not trying to be rude to, to an Islamic individual or a Hindu or whatever, or even to quote-unquote nominal Christians who really aren't believers but only in name. What I'm really trying to say is, I really want you to know the truth and for the truth to set you free. But what they hear is a proclamation of death. And so Christ leads us in this way as we go through this world. And so you don't understand it necessarily. I don't understand it as I'm going through it. But the reality is that as I'm going through dealing with these afflictions and God is working in my life, that he is setting me up, if you would, for everybody to look at and to be life to one and death to the other. It sounds awful, but you know what? In the day of judgment at the great white throne, every knee will what? Bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Yahweh to the glory and praise of God. But not everybody in the day of judgment is going to go to spend time with God for all of eternity. Why? Everybody's going to be judged. Everybody, including us. Everybody is going to be judged based upon your works. And we're all condemned based upon our works. Who gets the pass? What does the book of Revelation tell us? It's not my, this is not my thoughts. This is what Revelation 20 tells us straight off the bat. Whosoever's name was written in the Lamb's book of life. Period. That's it. Whoever's written in the Lamb's book of life. I believe that people have had a chance to respond. Whether it's by creation, the revelation of God in creation. That, so you know, people always say, what about the person in Africa who's never heard about Jesus? They have the revelation of God in creation. They can look at creation and know there's a designer. And then at that point, it's between them and God. Does that make sense? God's a God of grace. But the reality is that salvation is only purely there. And if people reject the message, then you are a what? In order of death to them. i got to keep moving. Anyways, so the burden of Paul... But we go on then to this boasting of Paul, which he does, starts as a kind of like a parenthesis. Coming out of his teaching about, um, this is still verse 12 back in chapter 1. It's still part of the burden part, but it's kind of the transitional where he kind of gets caught up into this thing. And he says, for our boasting is this, the testimony, the witness of our conscience that we conducted ourselves in the word in the world. What's kind of fun is that word conducted, I want to talk, real, real, highlight it, is the word anastrepho. Literally, it means to invert or turn upside down. So, his conduct in the world was inverted to the way the world thought. That, so put the word invert in there. That we inverted ourselves in the world. Isn't that kind of cool? Before I got saved, I lived this way. When I came to know Jesus, what happened to me? There was an inversion that happened. I don't live the same way anymore. The, the self, um, the, in the, the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the, the base need is self-survival. When you come to know Christ, that inverts. It's not anymore. Because it doesn't matter. I know where I'm going. For me to live is Christ. To die is gain. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Do you really believe it? I mean, I remember when I drove truck, you know, about, well, I don't know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, whatever it was. And I was driving a delivery truck, and I'd meet these other truck drivers. and say, hey, how's it going? I said, it's great. If it, was good, if it was any better, I'd be dead. And they were like, what? It's not that bad. I said, no, you didn't listen. It's great. Things are great. If they were any better, I'd be dead. Dude, I mean, that, no, that's morbid. I mean, it can't be that bad. Listen to me one more time. Things are great. My life is great. The only way it could get any better is if I was dead. And they're just going to look at me like, you don't know Jesus. See, when I die, because I know Jesus, when I die, it's not going to get any better than that. Eye has not seen nor ear has heard, what, or nor has it entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for those who 
love him. When I die, it's great. It's great here. But the whole, whole holds nothing compared to what it's going to be like when I'm with Jesus. In inversion, you think differently. We conducted ourselves in this world in simplicity. The, literally, the word there is with no plies. So think about your toilet paper. The, the big thing is how many plies it is, you know? I mean, we used to get one place. I worked in Markel Paper Mills years ago as well, and they had the one-ply toilet paper. And you don't, yeah, that's not good. You want multiple ply, right? Well, the idea is Paul's saying, I didn't have multiple plies. I was single. That word for simplicity is literally a single-minded. In simplicity or singleness, in godly sincerity, literally that word there, sincerity, is judged by the light. That's really kind of cool. That vroom, so this godly judgment by the light, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God and more abundantly towards you. For we, now we get into this parenthesis, for we are not writing any other things to you than what you read or understand. Now I trust you will understand even to the end, as also you have understood us in part that we are your boast as you also are ours in the day of the Lord Jesus. And in this confidence, I purposed, intended, to come to you before that you might have a second favor or grace benefit to pass by the way of you to Macedonia to come again from Macedonia to you to be helped or sent forward literally by you on my way to Judea. What's he saying? Paul said, look, here's my plan. Here's my, my goal is that I had the singleness of purpose in the ministry that I had because my goal is to reach the world for Christ, Right. And you in Corinth, remember we talked last week just a little bit about where Corinth is situated. They're where? They're in the crossroads of of everything. So they're in the north-south of of Greece, up into Macedonia. They are east-west. The boats would travel, and they would stop, and they would come across the isthmus of Corinth. In order to to get away from some of the bad waters of the Mediterranean, they actually came through like the Panama Canal, but there was the, the Corinth. Um, isthmus, there was like a canal that they would come across and drag the boats over across and put them back into the water. And so Paul's, Paul's letting them know that's where, they, that's where they live, right? And so Paul was, gonna, was planning to come through them so that they could financially help him on his way. That's what he's talking about. So you could send me forth. You could help me. And he's going to talk about that when we get to chapter 8 and chapter 9 about their giving, okay? And how the, the Macedonians gave. And so so he's talking about, that was my purpose. I, I, I purposed to do this. This was my intent. So that you could support me. But he says, I didn't do it. Because I realize I've been an affliction to you. Look what he says. Therefore, verse 17, oh, I'm going to skip that part. You can read all that, but yes, yes, no, no. Um, verse 23, moreover, I call God as a witness, again, same word as before about my conscience being a witness, against my soul that to spare you I came no more to Corinth, not that we have dominion over your faith, but our fellow workers. You guys have started to see me, not you guys, but this is Paul talking to the Corinthians, as the, someone who's lording it over you. And I, want, I, don't, I don't want you to look at me that way. We're really just fellow workers. That's why for me, you can call me Pastor Bob if you want to, but I know the reality is I'm just you. We're, it's, this is the body of Christ. It's his church, not my church. I just have a, a privilege of, of being a voice box and a teacher. That's my function in the body. We each have a function. My function is just to teach. And I rejoice in the Lord for that. But there's nothing special about me. If God allowed me to die today, somebody else is going to pop up. God's going to raise somebody else up to teach. Does that make sense? Because it's his body. But Paul realized that they started to get this lordship thing with him. That Because Paul was a very bold, arrogant guy. And he spoke that way. Very hard. Make sense? And that's okay. Um, because... Again, those are personality types. But the people at Corinth were sort of recoiling a little bit on this. And so he said, look, I didn't want to come because this is things going on here, okay? But we're fellow workers for your joy, for your faith, for by faith you stand. 
verse 1 of chapter 2, we continue on with the same. Remember, this is a letter. We break into the chapters, but I don't know why the break is here, because it continue on. But I determined this within myself, that I would not come again to you in sorrow. For if I make you sorrowful, then who is he who makes me glad, but the one who is made sorrowful by me? And I wrote this very thing to you, lest when I come I should have sorrow over those from whom I ought to have joy, having confidence in all this, that my joy is the joy of you all. For out of much affliction, back to these afflictions, in anguish of heart I wrote to you with many tears, not that you should be grieved, sorrowed. Same word, Greek word. So we're, we're play, playing between the word lupe and lupeo. Okay? It's the same. Okay? Not that you should be sorrowed, but that you might know the love which I have so abundantly for you. But if anyone has sorrowed grief, he has not sorrowed me, but all of you to some extent, not to be too severe. I'll finish that in a second. So Paul says, look, I wanted to relieve your sorrow. Hence, I didn't come. I wanted to come so you guys could help me on my way. I needed help on my way, but I chose not to come because your need was greater than my need. The mind of Christ, isn't it? In my afflictions, in my need for help from you, I realized if I came to you, I really wouldn't be a help to you. I would only be considering my own wants, my own desires, my own needs. And so I didn't come. But I'm sending this word because I'm going to come back. We'll get to that in chapter 8 and chapter 9. I'm going to come back, and there's going to be a collection for the saints of Judea, not for me. And I want you to be prepared for that moment when I come back. But I didn't come by right now, even though I have this need. I didn't come by because I didn't want to cause you to be sorrowful. I didn't want to bring any affliction upon you. I've already been an affliction to you. I don't want to do it any more. And then he gets into a specific little affliction, a specific little problem Little problem that he talked about in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. There's actually someone among you who is sinning like even the world wouldn't sin. Even the Gentiles don't sin. And rather than, this is from 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and rather than you all dealing with this man in discipline, that instead of dealing with him in discipline, you are glorying in this moment. This man was living with his father's wife. That was pretty bad. And so Paul says, look, you ought to expel this guy. You ought to hand him over to Satan so that his flesh will be destroyed, but his soul will be saved. I've already judged him. That's pretty harsh. We've had to do that in the past at a previous church I was at. We literally said that. We're handing his his body over to, to Satan, so his flesh will be destroyed, but his soul will be saved. It was a man who walked away from his, from his family, and he wouldn't have any repentance at all in it. It was hard. It was awful. But in love, we did it. Not out of anger, not out of spite. We tried to reach him. We tried to go knock on his door, call him, wrote him letters. That was the end result. Fortunately, here, this man apparently what? We repented. And so Paul says... Now, in the midst of all this sorrow, look, it had an effect. It may, I may have burdened you. I may have afflicted you. I may have sorrowed you. But guess what? It worked. This guy has repented. Ch- people don't like church discipline. I'm not going to go into church discipline right now. I won't have time. People don't like church discipline. But there's a reason for it. Out of love to restore a brother. We had the illustration listed for us in the Word where it worked. And so Paul says, listen, lest the sorrow become so great, restore him. So Satan, again, spiritual realm, Satan doesn't have a foothold. Bring him back in. Bring him back. He's repented. Bring him back. That's exactly what we need to do. So in the end, what's your view of trouble and affliction? Are you looking at it from the world's perspective that this is a hindrance to your, your joy of life? Or are you looking at it from the perspective of God? 
that God gives these things to you as an opportunity to reveal him to the world. Are you trusting in God in the midst of the trials that you might be going through currently? There's no temptation, troublesome situations overtaking you, but such is common to man. So the reality is, probably every single one of you, in some manner, are going through some affliction, some greater than others, for sure. Are you trusting God in the midst of it? Is it your desire to glorify God in spite of the adversities which you may be facing? Long statement, but important statement. As you go through tribulation and affliction, one of the greatest trials is learning to grow in the mind of Christ by continuing to place the value and needs of others above your own. What do I mean by that? I'm going through afflictions and trials in my life, right? And I'm just trying to what? Just get through it. Survive. But now also, like Paul, right? He comes up against somebody else who has a what? A need. Whose need is greater, becomes greater. That's exactly right. The mind of Christ. Your need is always greater than my need. Your value is always greater than my value. Bob struggles with this. That's where this is easy for me to come up with because this is where the rubber meets the road for Bob all the time. It's easy when life is easy to come along somebody who's afflicted. But when you're afflicted, when you're feeling down, when you're feeling like I can't deal with anything more, and God decides, oh, yeah, you really can. Here, let me add something else to your plate. How do you deal with it? That, to me, is the greatest part of the lesson learned, is when in the midst of that trial, looking at somebody else with a trial and putting their need as being more important than my need. Or usually it's not even my need. It's usually my want. Is there then a need to change the way you think? Change the way you think. Metanoia literally is the word for repent. Is there a need to change the way you think and therefore change the way you act? Because if we change the way we think, ultimately it will lead to us changing the way we act. Let's pray. Father, thank you for you. Thank you that you loved us before we ever even knew you, while we were at enmity with you, while we were fighting against you, you loved us. Lord, you are an awesome God. Forgive me, Lord, for being so self-centered, so egocentric. Lord, you desire the body to be your body, for us to love one another, to be, have care for one another. And yet we struggle in that, Lord, to be honest, because we are, again, so self-centered. Help us, Lord, to have the mind of Christ that the world may look in and see what you do within us and in our midst, and they might want it, Lord. They might magnify you as God. Lord, help us not to to send out a picture of judgmentalism and, and such, and yet hold, holding firm to the truth. But in love, Lord, in love, revealing your grace and your mercy in the midst of the afflictions and the trials of this life, that you might receive the glory. In Christ's name, amen.